so this is um, uh, a workshop that we have been running until uh, since last year. This is the fourth installment. Um, I do want to announce uh, before we actually get started that the session will be recorded so we can afterwards mm -hmm. um, put it online for those who cannot join today. Um, another thing, please mute yourselves, keep your microphones muted to avoid feedback and other interferences. Um, we will, of course, give you the opportunity to ask questions and we will also allow you to speak and then unmute yourselves uh, when called upon. That's something that I will then announce. In the meantime, please keep the microphone muted. Um, another piece of information, Anna Simpson from the ISB is in the meeting as well. If you have anything uh, pertinent to uh, today's discussion to share with her, uh, she will be posting her email address in the chat and would be happy for you to send her follow-up questions or comments. So Baha, I think recording is running. So welcome again, all of you. Um, number four in our series of IFRS EAA virtual workshops. Um, this one is, um, and I'm glad to say that I'm really happy about this. This is the first one to formally involve EFREC. And today we're gonna to be discussing business combinations under common control. So the accounting by the receiving company for a business combination in which all of the combining businesses ultimately are controlled by the same party before and after the combination. Um, let me also say that we're going to have more of these virtual workshops to come. Another one, the number five, is already being planned. It's going to be on the accounting for crypto assets like Bitcoin and other types of uh, crypto currencies. All of these uh, events, all of these workshops are going to be recorded and provided on the EAA's Accounting Resources Center website. And they're also part of a growing suite of European Accounting Association virtual activities, including... Uh, which some of you might be familiar with our virtual accounting research seminar. So it looks like we have about 100 participants and I'm really looking forward to lively discussion that this will generate and we would hope to uh, generate by this um, input to the ISB standard setting process and thereby help improve ultimately, of course, accounting for business combinations under common control. But also, of course, for you guys, um, we would like to generate valuable insights for your teaching, but also potentially research ideas in this, uh, in this context. Um, so that also already to, uh, takes me to the purpose of the session. Again, the ISB will give an overview of the ISB's preliminary views on this accounting issue. And we will also have an overview by Patricia McBride on FREX emerging views for consultation. And then we will be able to answer your questions, obtain feedback from you on these views. And also we have a colleague here, Martin Hohendorn, who I will introduce in a second, who will provide related academic commentary. So this takes me to the brief, to a brief introduction of our participants and Tarka is going to be representing the ISB staff. We have Patricia McRide, the technical director of EFRAG. Welcome to both of you. Julia Fegina and Paolo Dragona are going to be representing uh, the ISB staff members who are working on this business combinations and the common control project. And also then last but not least, our academic colleague, Martin Hochendorn. Uh, Martin actually is well known among the EAA community, of course. Still, I wanna um, highlight a little bit how special Martin is in terms of uh, the kind of things that he does, the kind of positions that he holds, which is rare among academics. So he's not only a professor of financial accounting at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam, he's also chairman of the Limburg Institute. This is an inter-university organizing committee that runs PhD education for accounting researchers in the Netherlands. He's also a judge at the business court in Amsterdam and a special advisor of, of financial reporting to the Dutch Ministry of Justice. Until 2007, he was chairman of the Dutch Accounting Standards Board as well, and a partner at EY until 2014. So he will be providing commentary from an academic, but also, of course, practitioner perspective on this accounting standard. Briefly, uh, in terms of the format, so we're going to have an overview of the ISB's preliminary views, followed immediately by FREG's emerging views for each of the sections uh, of this document and each of the sections will also be succeeded by Martin's academic commentary 
and a polling question to you in the uh, among the participants a polling question that you can answer within zoom here and then we're going to move into a q and a session where you're welcome to ask your questions in the chat and i'll be happy to call upon you um, by um, asking you to open your microphones so you see that we're in a meeting format here not a webinar the chat is open for you to use you can see each other please make sure that the chat doesn't get too cluttered with you know uh, incidental contents so that we can keep track of the questions being asked. Um, if you would not like to speak up, if you're just sharing information um, that the ISB or Africa could consider, or that is interesting for us, uh, your colleagues, please uh, preface, your, uh, preface your chat comment with chat only. And ideally, also please indicate who, would you, uh, who you would like uh, your question to be for. All right, so without further ado, let me now hand over to Antarka to introduce the objective of the ISB's project and give us an overview of today's agenda. Over to you, Anne, thank you. Uh, thank you, Thorsten. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank Thorsten. I'd like to thank the EAA for their fantastic support, allowing us to get together with so many academics in so many countries around the world. This is just a fantastic initiative from Thorsten and his team from the EAA and all of us at the IFRS Foundation really appreciate this opportunity. So thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed the session. Let me tell you about the session. So next slide, please, Julia. Um, what we would like to talk to you about after my very brief introduction to the project, um, we're discussing which method to apply in the BC UCC situation. Um, we've been the board's been looking at two methods, the acquisition method of IFRS 3 and a book value method. So we're going to work through all that material with you today, and we're really looking forward to having your questions and having a discussion. Next slide, please, Julia. So let me just set the scene with this slide. Now, IFRS 3, Business Combinations, sets out the requirements for business combinations between unrelated parties and requires the acquisition method. So there is a scope exclusion that business combinations under common control are not in IFRS 3. So this gap in the IFRS standards results in diversity in practice. Um, in some companies, uh, some cases we observe that companies use the acquisition method to report a BC UCC and that gives the fair value information of the combination. But equally, in other cases, companies are using a book value method, which provides historical book value information about those combinations. Uh, in addition, there's diversity in how a book value method is applied. And finally, what we've observed is that companies often disclose very little information about the combinations. So business combinations under common control are common in many jurisdictions around the world and stakeholders have asked the board to address this gap in IFRS standards. The diversity in practice in reporting the combinations is a particular concern for securities regulators. So our objective for the project, so the board's objective is to de develop requirements that would result in better information for users of financials statements about business combinations under common control. So the board's not only looking to reduce diversity in practice, but also to ensure that useful information is provided about these combinations and so that transparency in reporting is improved. So that's the why of the project. Let's now jump into the detail. I'd like to hand back to, um, oh, first I'd like to hand to um, Patricia to speak to us about EFRAG and their consultation process on this project. Over to you, Patricia. Patricia, I'm trying to move yep. the slide, but it's um, a piece a little bit frozen at the moment. Let oh. me just try and reshare the screen. Uh, Joyce of technology. No, exactly. Well, 
while, while you're finding the screen, I'd like to thank the EAA for allowing EFRAG to join for the first time. And we expect to see a lot more of these very interesting uh, seminars. Uh, we're look, looking forward to our next one being involved with the Crypto Assets Project. The reason why I wanted to talk about the consultation process is we're slightly stepping out of order in this case. What we normally do is is developed a draft comment letter. And after that draft comment letter has been approved through all of our approval processes, we move on to consultation and then the final comment letter. Now, in this case, our draft comment letter isn't going to be finalized until next week. So this comes with a big red warning that everything that I'm going to be saying is our best estimate of what our draft comment letter will say. But like everything to do with developing drafts, it is subject to change without notice. Mm -hmm. We also, during the consultation period, will be looking at webinars with users, preparers, academics, and any other interested parties. We would encourage you to join any of those that interest you and information about these can be found on our website, efrag.org. And if you want to, if you haven't already, you can sign up for news items where you're automatically notified about everything that's going on. So the reason we needed this slide is to say best, what I'm going to be talking about today is our best estimate of our draft comment letter. It isn't guaranteed that it will be our draft comment letter. So passing you back to the ISB. Thank you very much, Patricia. I am attempting to move the slides again. Julia, while we're doing that, maybe I can I can uh, interject a quick note. So as this is about um, feedback and and input on a on an early stage project, um, I think this is a great opportunity. Also, maybe for you, when when it seems to fit during the presentations today also to indicate to the EAA members who attend um, uh, uh, whether there are research questions that uh, you might want uh, uh, EAA members to look at. So for example, I'm thinking about the kind of diversity in practice that has been mentioned as one of the uh, reasons for the project. Has that kind of diversity been uh, documented sufficiently? Uh, is there any knowledge about the information needs of the users of the receiving company uh, that might help with determining what method might be uh, most appropriate. That, those kind of questions, uh, if, if you have any of those, uh, this would be a perfect opportunity to, to uh, air them uh, with, the, with the participants. All right, over to you, uh, Of Julia. course. Okay, thank you very much. So hopefully you should all be seeing the scope slide at the moment. Yes. And I would like to start with uh, briefly talking about what is in the scope and out of the scope of this project. So first of all, as Anne has already mentioned, the main objective here really is to fill the gap in IFRS standards to provide better information, improve transparency, improve comparability. So speaking about the scope of the project, first of all, which transactions we are looking at? We are looking at all transfers of businesses under common control, even if a transfer of a business does not, technically speaking, meet a definition of the business combination. This could be the case, for example, if a new is formed and issues shares to acquire a single business. Technically speaking, this is not a business combination. However, if it is under common control, it will be in the scope of the project. Likewise, it doesn't matter why the company undertook a business combination under common control. It could be perhaps for regulatory reasons, tax reasons, internal efficiency reasons, or in preparation for an IPO, or it can even be conditional on an IPO. All transfers of businesses are in the scope of the project. And in the little diagram that you can see on the slide, so the transferred business here is company C. We are not looking at transfers of anything other than business. In other words, we only look at transfers of businesses. So for example, uh, transfers of assets 
transfers of groups of assets and liabilities that do not constitute a business or even transfers of companies they, that don't have a business are not in the scope of the project. And this is because other IFRS standards, unlike IFRS 3, do not have scope exclusions for transactions under common control. So that's why we're focusing on this type of the transaction. Another important point to highlight, and Torst has already mentioned that, we are only focusing on reporting by the receiving company in the business combination under common control. In the diagram presented, the receiving company is company A. We are not looking at other parties um, in the transaction. We are not looking at the reporting by controlling party, by the transferring party, or by transferred party. And this is, again, because all these other sides of the transaction are already covered by IFRS standards. And finally, which financial statements we are looking at? Typically, a business combination under common control will be reflected in receiving companies' consolidated financial statements. However, in some cases, uh, for example, when transferred business is not incorporated, so in those cases, accounting for the transaction could also affect individual or separate financial statements of the receiving company, company A. But what is really important here is that we are not looking at accounting for investment in subsidiary in company A's financial statements, again, because it's already covered by IFRS standards. We are only looking at accounting uh, for the transaction itself. Now, I would like to say a couple of words about the board's focus and the board's overall approach um, to analyzing this issue. So first of all, of course, the board focused on what is useful information for the primary users of the receiving company financial statements. And as illustrated on the slide, in the context of business combination under common control, we are focusing on non-controlling shareholders potential shareholders and lenders and other creditors of the receiving company, company A. We are not focusing on information needs of the controlling party, company P. And this is because controlling party controls the receiving company and therefore it can obtain the information it needs directly from the receiving company and it need not rely on company A's general purpose financial statements to meet, uh, to meet that information needs. In contrast, external party, non-controlling shareholders, potential shareholders, lenders and other creditors, they must rely on general purpose financial statements of company A as their source of information. So that's why we're focusing on those parties in this project. It is also important to point out, as conceptual framework tells us, that different primary uses may have different information needs. And it's important to focus on the common information needs of all those external primary users. And what it really means in the context of business combinations under common control is that depending on composition of primary users in different scenarios, the common information needs can be different and different types of information would best meet those common information needs. And we will see how it all plays out and supports proposed um, model in a few minutes. I also wanted to talk you through sort of main considerations that the board took into account in developing its preliminary views. So one of the important considerations for the board was how similar business combinations under common control are to regular business combinations between unrelated parties, which are in the scope of IFRS 3. And fundamentally, the board concluded that if and to the extent business combinations under common control are similar to business combinations between unrelated parties, the same information should be provided. And if and to the extent business combinations under common control are different from business combinations um, between unrelated parties, different information may need to be provided. Now, I have already spoken about common information needs of primary users, but that was the other board's consideration. Who are the primary users in each particular scenario and what does it mean for their common information needs? 
And again, the board noted that to the extent that primary uses in a business combination under common control are similar to primary uses of information in transaction between unrelated parties, the information needs a similar. And if uh, composition of primary uses is different, then different type of information may need to be provided. And very importantly, this is, of course, all subject to the cost-benefit trade-off, meaning that useful information should only be provided if the benefits of the information of primary users just as the costs of providing and um, analyzing that information. And very lastly, secondary but still important consideration for the board. In developing its preliminary reviews, the board sought to avoid complexity and creating new complex conditions. And the board also sought to eliminate, um, to effectively em eliminate choice of accounting treatment for companies that exist today. In other words, the board was looking to develop objective conditions that do not give rise to opportunities for accounting arbitrage for companies where a company can structure a transaction with the sole objective of achieving desired accounting treatment. And the model that the board has developed for the discussion paper essentially is a delicate balance between all those considerations. And the question, our main question to stakeholders is, you know, did the board strike the right balance between all those sometimes conflicting considerations? With that, we are moving on to the board's preliminary views on when the acquisition method and a book value method should be applied. And I will start with a brief overview of where the board landed, and then I will explain how the board got there. So fundamentally, the board concluded that business combinations under common control are not all the same, and therefore neither the acquisition method nor a book value method are appropriate in all cases. Fundamentally and in principle, the board concluded that the acquisition method should be applied to those business combinations under common control that affect non-controlling shareholders of the receiving company. However, this is subject to cost-benefit trade-off and to take into consideration that cost-benefit trade-off, the board is also proposing an exception and an exemption from the acquisition method in some transactions that affect non-controlling shareholders. And lastly, a book value method would be applied in all cases in all other cases. Now, in reaching those preliminary views, the board conducted initial rounds of consultations uh, with uh, stakeholders. And what transpired in those initial rounds of consultations, that stakeholders um, have three broad views about business combinations under common control. So some stakeholders argue that all business combinations under common control are different from business combinations between unrelated parties. They argue that all business combinations under common control do not have economic substance, and this is because ultimate control by the controlling party does not change. So in their view, all that happens is that the controlling party moves its economic resources from one pocket to another. And for that reason, these stakeholders believe that all business combinations under common control should be accounted under a book value method. Now, there is another of stakeholders who think that all business combinations under common control are similar to business combinations um, between unrelated parties. And this is because for the receiving company, the same effect happens in both types of combination. For the receiving company, in both types of combination, it acquires control over business that it did not control before. So for the receiving company, all business combinations under common control have economic substance. And therefore, the acquisition method should always be applied, perhaps subject to the cost-benefit trade-off. And lastly, there is another group of stakeholders who believe that uh, business combinations under common control are not all the same, and some of them may be similar to business combinations between unrelated parties, and others are not similar, and that these combinations may or may not have this elusive economic substance. And for those reasons, these stakeholders believe that in some cases the acquisition method should be applied, and in other cases, um, a book value method should be applied. 
Now, let's look at how the board uh, got to uh, its preliminary views. And let's first look at business combinations under common control that affect non-controlling shareholders of the receiving company and think about how similar they are to regular business combinations. What's important here is that these combinations can affect both publicly traded and privately held companies. So let's uh, look at what's happening in those scenarios. As you can see on the slide, both in business combination and in business combination under common control, company A acquires control of a business that it did not control before, company C. So from the point of view of the receiving company, both transactions have the same effect. Furthermore, not only for company A itself, but also for its non-controlling shareholders, the effect of the transaction is similar. In both scenarios, non-controlling shareholders of the receiving company indirectly acquire residual ownership interest in the transferred business, company C. Therefore, it's quite hard to argue that the controlling party simply moves its economic resources from one pocket to another. You can see on the slide that even though there is no change in ultimate control, there is actually a change and acquisition of ultimate economic interests in the transferred business. And the board concluded that such business combinations under common control are similar to business combinations between unrelated parties because there is a change in ultimate economic um, interests in the trusted business, and therefore the acquisition method would provide useful information about these combinations, like it does for business combinations between unrelated parties. However, the question then arises whether the acquisition method should be applied to all combinations under common control that affect non-controlling shareholders, or only to some of them and the question arises, well, what if non-controlling interest in the receiving company is small or non-substantive? And would the benefits of applying uh, the acquisition method justify the costs of applying that method in all scenarios where non-controlling shareholders are involved? And um, the board has considered various approaches to sort of how to draw the line and how to... Um, how to satisfy the cost-benefit trade-off for these combinations. And the board was also mindful of structure and opportunities. Again, even though it's not the primary consideration for the board, but the board did acknowledge that if the acquisition method would be required for all business combinations under common control that affect non-controlling shareholders, that could create opportunities for companies to structure transactions to achieve a um, particular accounting outcome. So in an attempt of balancing those considerations, the board is proposing that if the receiving company shares are publicly traded, then the acquisition method should be required. And this is because if receiving company shares are publicly traded, this, um, this entity will be subject to public market regulations and the non-controlling interest will likely be significant enough. So for this transaction, the cost-benefit trade-off is likely to be met. And then if receiving company shares are privately held, then in those cases, all non-controlling shareholders can be the company's related parties, or the non-controlling shareholders may not be even analyzing information like happens in the public market. So they may not be necessarily be always interested in fair value information. So the board proposing that if all non-controlling shareholders of the receiving company are the company's related parties, then the acquisition, method, the acquisition method should be prohibited and the company should be required to apply a book value method. And the board is also proposing an exemption in those scenarios when not all non-controlling shareholders are the company's related parties. So in those cases, the company is permitted to propose using a book value method. And if its non-controlling shareholders do not object to that method, then the company is allowed to apply a book value method instead of the 
acquisition method. I would like to highlight that this exemption is based on the exemption that already exists um, in IFRS standard. So this is not a new condition. Now, so this takes me next to business combinations under common control between wholly owned companies. So these transactions would be undertaken by private companies for tax reasons, regulatory reasons, or in preparation for an IPO. And I would like to focus on this uh, last scenario to illustrate um, what can happen in the situations. So suppose a controlling party, company P, wholly owns and controls business A and business B. And suppose in case one, business A and business B are held by a holding company and the controlling party wishes to sell them in an IPO. So in case one, company P can list Holker shares and as a result, potential investors in an IPO will receive historical book value information about both business A and business B. Suppose in case two, the controlling party has exactly the same two businesses, A and B, but they are not held via an intermediately, intermediary vehicle. They are held by controlling party directly. So in that case, if company P wishes to list A and B in an IPO, it must first undertake a restructuring. And company P controlling party could undertake a restructuring in a number of different ways. It could create a NUCA and move shares of A and B into NUCA. It could get company B to acquire company A and it could get company A acquire company B. So if the acquisition method were applied to these scenarios, then depending on how the combination is structured, and depending on which entity is identified as the acquirer, different information would be provided. However, if you look at both case one and case two, from the point of view of potential investors in an IPO, in all these scenarios, they are investing in exactly the same set of economic resources. And the board concluded that similar information must be provided in all those cases. And to achieve that, a book value method must be applied to this combination. It would then provide the same information regardless of how the combination is structured and regardless of whether the combination was even necessary in the first place. Now, what does it mean for lenders and other creditors? So if we apply the acquisition method to transactions that affect non-controlling shareholders and the book value method in all other scenarios, it means that lenders and creditors will receive different information in different circumstances. So the board considered their information needs and we performed initial round of consultations with users of financial statements who specialize in credit analysis. And what the board has noted that economic interest held by lenders and other creditors in the receiving company is very different from the equity interest which is held by non-controlling shareholders. And their economic interest is really limited to payments of principal and interest. And because of the nature of their economic interest in the receiving company, credit analysis focuses on the company ability to service its debt and to raise new debt. And to perform that analysis, lenders and creditors need information about cash flows and debt commitments of the receiving company. And what we have heard in our initial rounds of consultations, that that information and the outcome of credit analysis is largely unaffected by whether the acquisition method or a book value method is applied to business combinations under common control. And we have heard that even though information about fair values of particular assets is also useful, Again, the outcome of the credit analysis would not depend greatly on that information. So to summarize, where does it leave the board? Uh, so this flowchart uh, illustrates the decision-making process in determining which method to use. So the first question to think about, does the business combination under common control affect non-controlling shareholders of the receiving company? If the answer to this question is no, a book, value must, a book value method must apply. If transaction does affect non-controlling shareholders, the next question to consider is, 
Um, are the receiving company shares traded in a public market? If yes, again, end of analysis, the acquisition method must apply. If no, if receiving company is privately held, then it is necessary to consider whether all of its non-controlling shareholders are related parties. If they're all the company's related parties, then a book value method must apply. If not, then the company may propose to use a book value method. And if non-controlling shareholders do not object, it may use that method. If they do object, it must use the acquisition method. And just a couple of um, items to highlight on the slide. All the conditions in the flowchart are based on existing conditions in IFRS standards. The board has not created anything new uh, for this model. We are recycling what's already in IFRS. And secondly, both the acquisition method and the, um, the book value method are in use today and they're not new to companies. And with that, I hand it over to Patricia to talk about IFRAC's current expected um, position. Thank you, Julia. Right. Firstly, we are strongly in favor of this project. IFRAC back in 2011 issued a discussion paper which said very clearly that we think the ISB needs to work on this and we don't think that you can apply one single method to all business combinations under common control. So we start off agreeing with the ISB's basic premise. Um, we think for the non-controlling shareholders, uh, we should be using the acquisition method. So we're online with that. But we're also thinking about suggesting, and this, we're debating this at the moment, whether the book value method is inappropriate for example, com privately held companies with listed debt. So they are listed, but it's the debt that's listed or um, where assets are held in a fiduciary capacity like banks. We're considering suggesting that the acquisition method would be more appropriate than the book value method in those cases. And we continue to have concerns that the definition of a public market, which has created problems in the past, is going to potentially create problems in this area when this listing, non-listing is such a critical determinant. But for the plain vanilla, simple uh, restructure, internal restructuring, no change of ownership interests, then we completely agree that the book value method is appropriate. It allows users to continue their trend, anal their trend analyses. And um, we think it's going to sort out a lot of problems. But we've then been looking at the flow chart because everybody wants to rewrite everybody else's flow charts. And as we argued about it internally, we wonder whether it wouldn't be clearer if we turned the flowchart round and started off by testing for are you listed? Because that's something that's relatively straightforward without having to work out whether your shareholders are controlling or non-controlling shareholders. So we're potentially going to suggest a restructuring of the decision tree. Then we come to the exemption and exception. Julia, next slide, please. And what we support is the um, option, the exemption for privately held entities where they can um, get the approval of non-controlling shareholders. We think that's a very sensible solution and as it's a do not object rather than having to get positive approval mirrors the requirements in IFRS 10. We think that's worked, but we agree with the ISB that this should not be extended to publicly traded companies. When we come to the exception to the acquisition method based on for related parties, we're aware that there are a lot 
of relate there are a lot of different relationships and relation to parties it's a very very broad notion so we're consulting through our draft comment letter we expect to be consulting as to whether we think this should be mandatory or optional because if it's optional it will give the um receiving entity the ability to respond to its specific circumstances with its specific related parties. So we're going to raise the question and we'll find out whether the European view is that it would be better to be optional rather than as proposed in the discussion paper, mandatory. But for the rest, we are very much agreeing with the ISB. So Julia, back to you. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Lead over to to uh, Martin's commentary. So Martin has looked at this uh, issue from an academic perspective. I anticipate Martin that there probably isn't all that much empirical research on this yeah. because of the data issues that uh, that we've heard about and the inconsistent treatment and practice. But the issue does remind us of the pooling versus purchase controversy uh, that uh, has raised a lot of research, including conceptual research. Over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Thorsten. Thank you for your kind introduction also. Um, I'd like to start with giving my compliments to the discussion paper. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's very well written, illustrative, uh, and I find it a pleasure to read. Uh, as as Thorsten uh, already said, there is very little academic research on business combinations under common control. Uh, I think the reason is that there is a lack of availability of financial statements of parts of a group. There are a lot of financial statements of, of, of public listed entities, but not so much as parts of a group. So uh, this is a challenge for, for all you academic uh, researchers, uh, because this is a, a, a very new research topic. And I'm confident that with this discussion paper, this is a boost to, this, uh, the, to the research issues. I'd like to present a, a, a few empirical research outcomes and some conceptual comments, because if they're not so much empirical research, uh, there's one other way of thinking uh, from an academic point of view to the discussion paper, and that is from a conceptual point of view. Uh, let, let me first say that uh, I, I make my comments without prior knowledge of the tentative views of AFRAC. Uh, I've, I've seen that we have some uh, similar views, but uh, that they have been reached independently from, from each other. And let me also say that my conceptual comments are of a sort of personal character. It's not a sort of general view of the EAA community, of course. Well, we're on the next slide. And uh, Torsten already referred to purchase pooling. In the past, we had two systems in accounting for business combinations with external parties. The purchase method, which is comparable to the acquisition method, as it's now called in the, in the discussion paper, and a pooling of interest method, which is a book value method, not the book value method that is proposed by the IASB in its discussion paper, but one with retrospective application. And there has been some, some research on the choice of purchase pooling. And I've identified here two uh, interesting uh, empirical papers. Um, the, 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 I said it, the, that, that is the free choice between purchase accounting and pooling of interest accounting. That's not correct exactly, formally, uh, because uh, uh, at least in the US, you are only allowed to uh, apply for pooling of per, uh, interest accounting when certain conditions were fulfilled. But in the US, these were rather formal conditions and one could devise the acquisition in order to be allowed to apply the pooling of interest accounting. And many cases have been recorded where companies had a sort of mouse elephant of elephant mouse poolings, not, not equal parties, but just uh, making it uh, look like uh, uh, applying pooling while in fact it was a purchase. Well, two, uh, two uh, uh, empirical researchers. One is conclusion, concludes that the pooling method uh, generates enormous amounts of unrecognized assets. Of course, we know that, but this is a statement of fact as well. And recording and amortizing these assets, as you would do in purchase accounting, generates significant balance sheet and income statement effects. And uh, this, the, the implication of this research is that choosing for pooling could have been motivated by preventing these amortization effects. 
And uh, uh, the, the older academics still know probably that uh, there was talk of dirty pooling. Uh, pooling was misused uh, because of its accounting effects. Another uh, empirical research uh, has as a conclusion that CEOs with earnings based compensation are more likely to choose pooling and to avoid the earnings penalty associated with purchases. So again, there is a sort of earnings incentive to use pooling and not purchase accounting. But on the other side, I also found uh, uh, an empirical research on uh, business units under common control. It was in China. And there the conclusion is the other way around, that net income on the book value method is of higher relevance than that of the acquisition method. Of course, it's limited to China. You cannot see that as a general conclusion. But as I must say, that's sometimes the case with empirical research that you have different conclusions uh, uh, and that there is not one definite conclusion. And again, uh, that makes gives a lot of room for new empirical research on this issue. Next slide, please, Julia. Let me turn to some conceptual comments then. I, I have an, identified a few issues on the on the conceptual uh, uh, front. Uh, one is users. Only the presence of non-controlling shareholders makes a difference in the ISB model, not the presence of potential shareholders or lenders and other creditors. And if we look at lenders and creditors, uh, then uh, the conclusion that is uh, drawn in the uh, discussion paper is that for lenders and creditors of the receiving company, the usefulness of the acquisition method is limited based on feedback from st uh, stakeholders. I agree that uh, the interest of lenders and, and other creditors is limited to uh, receiving payments of principal interest. But on the other hand, they use accounting numbers to make future cash flow projections. And they use accounting numbers in loan covenants. So accounting numbers are relevant. And uh, why would not a fair value step up be relevant? Or a goodwill impairment, for instance, a goodwill impairment is an indication that the future cash flows will be very much lower. And if you have purchase accounting or the acquisition method, you can have goodwill impairments, but you, you will not have goodwill impairments by applying the book value method. And it also gives me a question, uh, academics do not always give answers, but also asks questions. Uh, if that's the conclusion, that it doesn't make a, a, a difference to apply uh, uh, acquisition method or book value method, does it mean that there is no usefulness of IFRS 3 for lenders and for other creditors? I would say again, a topic for empirical research. Let's go to the next slide. Another issue on stewardship and accountability. Uh, management of the receiving company might have its own legal responsibilities for adequate reporting to all its stakeholders, even if it's under common control. And then it should make financial statements as if it were a standalone company. A shareholder is just one of the stakeholders to report to. And uh, sometimes from a, an accountability perspective, you want to have the, the, the best financial statements uh, and, and not one with a more or less inferior method probably. About the related party exemption, Patricia talked about it from an effort point of view as well. Uh, uh, the acquisition method is not allowed, uh, and the general uh, uh, statement in the discussion paper is that related parties might not need to rely on its general purpose financial statements. I uh, agree with Patricia, inferring that it might not be the case for all related parties. It's a very diverse concept of related parties. If you only have significant influence, if you are a close family uh, member, for instance, you are a related party, but probably you uh, do, do not have much power to, to, uh, uh, to have uh, uh, other information than from um, the financial statements. And the problem is all the, the question is also what is the problem when the business combination has economic significance consideration is at fair value or when fair value can be reliable measure reliably measured what is the problem in applying the acquisition method in that case finally uh, 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 and i know it's out of scope but i want to pay attention to it the broader issue of intergroup transactions uh, uh, the business combinations on a common control is just one sort of intergroup transactions. 
And if you look at I4S, then a common concept is lacking. How to deal with intergroup transactions in general? Sometimes transactions need to be restated at fair value, and then the difference with the consideration is an equity transaction. Sometimes that's not allowed. Sometimes there's a free choice. Now, again, we have uh, on the intergroup transactions, uh, which are business combinations. So uh, I would, uh, my suggestion from an academic point of view would be to tackle as a sort of net pro next project intergroup transactions uh, as a general issue and to try to find some consistency in that. I have one more slide, uh, um, uh, Julia, on, on, on this issue. It's a final command sort of conclusion, you might say, why not allow receiving companies that do not have non-controlling shareholders to apply the acquisition method instead of requiring the book value method for these companies? Or in the other way around, why not require the acquisition method and give an optional exemption? Some ideas from that. Normally, we would say that acquisition method is, is superior to the, the, the book value method. It's more in line with cash flow, uh, the conceptual framework relevance, faithful representation. I do agree that cost benefit considerations are very important. Might pay, they might be very different for different companies. I would say that there need to be conditions that the business combinations has economic significance, has substance, fair value has been or could be reliably determined. Uh, we would not want to have a sort of new group uh, uh, applying uh, acquisition accounting. Uh, and from a comparability of your point of view, uh, there, there might be very significant subgroups with own shareholders, uh, sorry, own stakeholders with just one uh, dominant, uh, uh, one shareholder, but with own stakeholders. And for those significant subgroups, comparability with the companies that have non-controlling shareholders might be more important than comparability with financial statements of private companies that have none. Just as an example, I mentioned some subgroups of the Philips companies, 100% subsidiaries as medical systems, oral health care, consumer lifestyle. In former years, Philips Lightning, now after an IPO, Signify. These are very substantive subgroups. Why are they not allowed to uh, just have their financial statements uh, according to what I think is the, the best way of reporting? Well, th those are some of the questions. Uh, I hand over to Julia for, for polling questions. Thank you very much, Martin. Baha, shall I stop sharing my screen in order to do polling questions? No, not necessarily. I'm going to launch the polling questions now. Okay. Um, okay, perfect. So the first question is, we're interested to see your views on the nature of business combinations under common control. So do you think they're all similar to business combinations between unrelated parties? Do you think they're all different um, from those combinations because there is no change in ultimate control? Or do you think they're not a homogeneous population and some of them can be similar to combinations between unrelated parties and others are not? Baha, on my screen, I don't see any votes coming in yet. No, they, everyone needs to start voting, Vala. Uh -huh. Okay, we have one vote, perfect. We do encourage everyone to vote. As three votes is not really good enough for this audience. So it is it. Yeah, we cannot see anything. I will relaunch it. So someone must have pressed on it accidentally. Okay, hopefully everyone can see it now. 
so three options. It is always very interesting to watch as the sorting takes place because I think, if anything, it does illustrate that there is a big diversity in views with respect to those transactions. I'm quite pleased to see that, well, not anymore. <laughs> From the words that are coming in, it's, they seem to indicate that sort of the majority of the audience who have voted so far seem to be split between second option and last option. It does seem that a slight majority is sort of of the view that business combinations under common control are not all the same. Uh, and different methods are appropriate in different cases. Of course, the question is, well, how exactly you draw the line and where you draw the line, and there are different considerations here. But um, yes, I think most of the audience seems to be in this last view. Shall mm -hmm. we um, add this question and go to the next one? What do you think? Almost again, would you like to would you like to uh, launch a new poll? Uh, possibly. So I think about a half of the audience is, has voted already on this one. So we can see what's happening. And let's uh, let's test the voters with a second question. Mm -hmm. So there's already answers to that as well. Oh, I didn't realize it was happening. So all, all three are. Ah are being okay. voted on already. Okay, perfect. I couldn't see it on my screen. And again, with the second question and the third question, we can see a variety of views. Um, yes, so second question, fairly equally split by, between different positions, all, all types of positions. On the last one, it does look the majority of the audience is supportive of the, of the board's preliminary view, so I'm pleased to see that. Um, uh, Torsten, is it time to go to Q&A session on this? Yes, we can We can actually do this in the meantime. Okay. It seems that my microphone had been mis... Uh, uh, had been... Uh, uh, malfunctioning because I already <laughs> initiated Q&A a couple of times, but nobody seems to have heard. So my my uh, my take was, please, uh, everybody, uh, put your questions into the chat. One of uh, one comment already came from Antarka, who would like to uh, relate to Martin's points uh, on the empirical insights from China. And would you like to come in about that? Thanks, Thorsten. I just wanted to echo um, Martin's comment that there is very little research and to encourage people, if, especially if they can get access to the financial statements within a group and um, can give us some research, it would be very, very useful. Um, it's great that the Chinese authors have had a go, it's fantastic. Um, I, I, would, I would say their conclusions um, are preliminary and we do have difficulty applying them into other jurisdictions. They did an interesting thing where they tried to look at value relevance in the note disclosure regarding the um, combination. So in China, the requirement is to use a book value method. And what they did was have um, construct some as if information uh, based on uh, how it would have looked if a fair value method was used used with acquisition methods. So it was a really interesting project and, you know, great, great to have that attempt. Um, but I think in terms of 
standard setting, it's it's a preliminary result. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks, Thorsten. Back to you. Thank you, Anne. So there's another question, which is so Elvia is asking about, and that's I think also interesting. What about situations in which the ultimate parent is government? Elvia, would you like to add to that? This would be to either Anne, Patricia, or Julia. So then let's let's let this question stand. So what happens if the ultimate parent is government? Uh, I could perhaps quickly comment on that from the um, ISP's preliminary views perspective. So there are no exclusions or no special conditions in the proposed model, depending on the nature of common control. So it doesn't matter whether common control is exercised by a company, by an indiv individual, by a group of individuals that have common control, for example, by contractual arrangement or government, all those cases will be um, in the scope of the project and in the scope of the prop proposed model. However, of course, we are, we are very early in the journey at the moment, and we would be very interested in stakeholder feedback, whether some particular types of common control, like government control, warrant some special conditions. So we welcome your views on that. And we've heard nothing at FRAG that this is an issue. So at this stage, we have no information. So Elvia, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Would you like to follow up on uh, on the background of, of your concern or what or, or of your uh, um, no. question? I, I, I got the answers. Thank you so much. Uh, All, right. All right. Okay, okay thank good. you. Good. So right now the chat is somewhat silent, but I would like to, answer, to ask a question actually. And um, this, this is to the ISB because I'm really interested in how the outreach activities so far have been progressing. You mentioned, Julia, on slide 12, that there were three groups, roughly three groups of uh, respondents so far that had different views on uh, on how to approach uh, on how to approach this issue, um, can you maybe um, talk a little bit about uh, what those different groups looked like? For example, was one of them, um, you know, more representative of users versus another, perhaps more representative of preparers, or in other words, what did users favor uh, in terms of the three approaches? Okay, so let me uh, let me try to answer this question. So first of all, I would like to make a general comment that those three camps that we have identified, of course, we have only been through our initial rounds of consultations, and we primarily talked to our standing standing consultative groups. So, for example, ASAP Accounting Standards Advisory Forum, which is a group of national standard setters. We have talked to CIMAC a capital market advisory group, which is our standing user uh, consultative group. We've talked to GPF, which is our preparers forum. We've talked to emerging economists. So these were the type of stakeholders we, we talked to so far. We did do a dedicated outreach with um, users who specialize in credit analysis because we really wanted to understand what would work for lenders and other creditors. And I think it's fair to say that the views we've heard so far, they and split. They seem to be split more by jurisdiction, not entirely, but I think in the jurisdiction or what are the local gap requirements mm -hmm. and which for you that there is jurisdiction. For example, in Canada, for business combinations under common control, uh, under Canadian GAP, it's depending on the effect on non-controlling shareholders and the price of the transaction. I and I. Canada, again, I'd like to emphasize its initial feedback, but it indicates over board's proposed model. In contrast, in, in some other jurisdictions, for example, in China, 
under their local gap, they apply a book value method to business all cases. And of course, the initial feedback we've heard from China, unsurprisingly, supports uh, the application of a book value method to all business combinations under common control. And then just to give you another example, uh, in Australia, for example, there seems to be a lot of interest in fair value information and often in pre-IPO scenarios, uh, fair value information is provided rather than a book value information. And of course, that jurisdiction in our initial consultations seems to be more supportive of sort of more fair value. So, so just to summarize, I think so far it's more driven by the current practice and current uh, local requirements in a particular jurisdiction. Now, with respect to users of financial statements, Again, in our initial consultations on the project, I think it's fair to say that overall we've heard support for uh, using the acquisition method in cases when non-controlling shareholders are affected. There was also support for the basic notion that if you have a combination and preparation for an IPO, then the structuring of that combination should not affect accounting outcome. In other, in other words, um, what we've heard is that, okay, either everything should be on historical book value basis or everything should be at fair value, which is so-called fresh start accounting, but there was little support for using fair value uplift for some companies and historical book value for other companies, depending on which company they acquire and which company is the acquiree. But again, I'd like to reiterate uh, that these were all initial rounds of our consultations. And also, I think what we've noticed with users of financial statements that in some cases, uh, their view um, on business combinations under common control depend on their sort of specialty, a type of analysis that they do, do they rely on valuation or do they do a lot of cash flow projection, projections themselves? So in some cases, when, comp when, when users want to sort of rely on existing valuations, they seem to prefer fair value information. And where they, where they do a lot of detailed analysis themselves, they seem to quite like a book value information and sort of, you know, seeing those historical trends. So that's much as we have seen so far in our consultations. Okay. Thank you very much. I would like to um, uh, take another question from the chat, and this is, I think uh, an important cl clarification. So Jose Luis asks, um, what is exactly meant when you say non-controlling interests are or are not affected? Maybe that might be something that uh, deserves clarification. And that's, uh, that's actually a perfect, a very, very good question. And it's probably not um, as uh, technically spelled out in a discussion paper as we would otherwise have done because we're trying to keep discussion paper quite simple and make it quite accessible accessible but fundamentally we are talking about non-controlling shareholders in the receiving company so we are talking about situation so we're not talking about non-controlling shareholders in selling company and and what we're trying to capture here is the situation where there is an acquisition of ultimate ownership interest um, in the transfer business. So for receiving company itself, there is always an acquisition. For its controlling party, there is no acquisition because it already owns economic interest in the transfer business. But then for non-controlling shareholders, is there an acquisition from their point of view? And this is what we're trying to capture here. Okay, thank you. So, Jose Luis, this answered the question? I hope. Okay. Good. I think looking at the time, we're perfectly um, in sync with our, uh, with our agenda, but we might have a couple minutes to look at Irina's question. Irina, would you like to, would you like to ask it yourself? Uh, okay, I would like to ask the question about the loss of the control. And as far as I understand, uh, we have we have um, some examples when the loss of controls of shares uh, is uh, 
related with the um, parties on the common control. And just now I would like to wonder if this issue will be uh, included to the scope of any project. Uh, so maybe just to reiterate um, on the scope. So we are looking at scope exclusion in IFRS 3. IFRS 3 generally deals with accounting by the acquirer in a business combination. However, IFRS 3 scopes out business combinations under common control. And this is what we are looking at in this project. We are looking at the accounting by the receiving entity. And, and the reason I'm not saying acquire or because, of course, you know, in some cases we apply book value method under the board's preliminary reviews. But we are looking at the receiving company to which business is transferred in a business combination under common control. So we're looking to bridge the gap which currently exists in IFRS 3. I understand, but the problem is for not the problem is with the um, accounting for the transferred party. So what it should be for transferred party, that party who loses the control. Uh, I may not fully understand your question, and maybe maybe this is a type of question which is better taken offline. Yes. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think I first stand deals with situation of loss of control, regardless of who uh, the company is sold to. So I'm not sure what what you have in mind here. So Irina, you might want to phrase this question uh, as an email to to Anna Simpson, and then this might so the ISP might be able to take this up. Okay, okay, thank you. All right. Good. So thank you so far. Um, I would now like to turn over to uh, Paolo, who will uh, introduce the second section uh, of the workshop. Paolo, over to you. Thank you. Um, so now I will cover how to apply the acquisition method. Uh, and um, as I said earlier, the board's preliminary view is that the acquisition method should apply to those transactions that result in a substantive change in ultimate ownership interest in the transferred company, just as it happens in a business combination covered by IFRS 3. However, in a business combination under common control, the consideration paid might be different from the consideration that will be paid in a business combination between unrelated parties. For example, the receiving company and the transferring company may not have been involved in deciding the financial terms of the transaction. The board examined whether this difference could indicate a transfer of wealth to or from the controlling party. The issue is discussed in the following slides. The board concluded that because business combination under common control are related party transactions, Additional information about transaction price should be disclosed. Before we start slide 32, uh, explains what happens when the acquisition method is applied to a regular business combination under IFRS 3. As you know, when the fair value of consideration paid exceeds the fair value of assets and liability identified, the acquirer recognizes a goodwill as a residual amount. When equal values are exchanged, goodwill comprises pre-existing goodwill in the acquired business and the price paid for expected synergies. This is illustrated on the left-hand side of the slide. In some cases, it's also possible that the price paid includes an overpayment, which is recognized within the initial carrying amount of goodwill and subject to subsequent impairment tests. Occasionally, a bargain purchase can occur between unrelated parties. In those cases, a gain is recognized in the statement of profit or loss. The gain is measured as the difference between the fair value of the consideration paid and the fair value of the assets and liability acquired. And this is shown on the right-hand side of the slide. The board consider whether the logic and the mechanics of IFRS 3 can also apply to business combination under common control. And the board observed, uh, next slide please, uh, the board observed that if the consideration paid 
in a business combination under common control is higher than the consideration that will be paid in a normal business combination, the excess constitutes a distribution from equity by the receiving entity. In the board's view, distribution are unlikely to occur because many jurisdictions have legal requirements protecting minorities. The board also, also think that in practice, distributions are difficult to be known at the acquisition date and it will be challenging if not impossible to quantify them. Accordingly, board's preliminary view is that the excess will be initially included in goodwill and addressed through subsequent impairment testing, just as it occurs in a regular business combination. On the right hand side of the slide, we have a combination under common control where the consideration is lower than in an arm's length transaction. In those situations, legal protections discussed earlier might not apply. This is because financial terms will not adversely affect non-controlling shareholders of the receiving entity. The board's preliminary view is that if a bargain purchase takes place in a combination under common control, any such underpayment economically represents a contribution to equity of the receiving company, rather than a gain that is recognized in the statement of profit and loss. In slide 34, we have some feedback from stakeholders on the topic we discussed earlier. In the interest of time, I will, go, I will not go through them, and the discussion paper contains a fuller discussion, and I'm sure most of you are already familiar with them. Slide 35 summarizes the board's preliminary view on how to apply the acquisition method to business combination under common control. Assets and liabilities acquired will be measured at fair value, just as it occurs in a regular business combination. The difference between the fair value of the consideration and the fair values of net assets transferred will be typically recognized as a goodwill, like under FRS3. If the price paid includes an element of overpayment, that overpayment will be recognized within the initial carrying amount of goodwill, which will be subject to subsequent impairment tests, as it also occurs in a regular business combination. However, if the price paid is below the fair value of assets and liabilities acquired, such difference will be recognized as a contribution to equity of the receiving entity. And when and with this, I hand it to Patricia, I think. Patricia, you, you would have to unmute yourself, please. Happens to me all the I time. I always forget. <laughs> me too. Okay, so if we look at the distributions from equity, we support the ISB. Uh, we think it makes a lot of sense that the difference is recognized in goodwill. When we look at the other side of the equation, we're looking at two different approaches with this contribution to equity. Our first thought is that we understand that the ISB's proposal, uh, that we're not dealing with an actual gain in transaction from the ultimate controlling party's in viewpoint, and it's not really a bargain purchase offers, offering um, budget and purchase gain in line with IS-1. But on the other hand, it is inconsistent with IFRS-3. We are dealing with the acquisition method. And so our, we're going to be asking our constituents whether it wouldn't be better to align with IFRS-3 rather than following the uh, proposal in the DP. So we're open to this, but we do see two possible answers and we are unlikely to finalize that until we've heard back from constituents over our consultation period. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. So hey. Martin, let's, let's see what, what academic research can say about this. Well, very little uh, specifically, but uh, uh, I will have uh, some uh, bargain purchase uh, empirical research, but st first start with conceptual comments. I think that uh, uh, it's very uh, good to uh, have uh, the acquisition method as set out in IFRS 3 uh, to consistently applied when you have an acquisition method on the BCUCC. 
uh, including uh, giving the same disclosure. There's one question I have there. That's the issue of reverse takeover. That's 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 an issue at, which is in IFRS 3, but which might be quite difficult if you have a business combination under common control. And uh, probably the suggestion is that reverse takeover uh, is, is applicable as well in this situation, but I don't know. And, and if it is, maybe uh, finally in the, in the um, uh, final uh, uh, statement uh, standard, some uh, attention should be paid to how to deal with reverse takeovers. I agree also with the discussion paper that generally one might assume that the consideration is equal to or close to the fair value because non-controlling shareholders are involved. On the one hand, they are protected in most cases, uh, the minority shareholders. And on the other hand, you will not give away uh, uh, money to non-controlling shareholders uh, uh, freely for nothing. So normally you would make this at fair value. Uh, I, uh, I've seen two inconsistencies. First one is with I as 106. Uh, why not require that if there are indications that a consideration does not equal fair value, which is an exception, we would not expect that to be. So uh, from a practical point of view, that does not uh, create a, quite a problem for most companies. But if there are indications and if it is different, why not, in line with IAS 1106, require that a difference would be recognized in equity as being a contribution or a distribution? And the other inconsistency is, as uh, Patricia has pointed out uh, just as well, with IFRS 3. And I have the same question is a departure from IFRS 3, where we recognize the excess of the fair value as a contribution to equity sufficiently justified? Uh, the bar gate purchase, they do reflect the fair value of the transferred company. Uh, in most cases, they are no bar gain at all. And that is the empirical research. I'd like to refer to re a relatively recent accounting and business research, 2019. Bar gain purchase gains are not significantly valued by the stock market. And I know from practice that in most cases, there is not a bar gain, but it's just a, 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 a expect an, a, a, an expected future losses that are reflected in, in that difference. Um, so you would say uh, uh, profit or loss is not uh, very much suitable in these uh, situations, but that's an IFRS 3 issue, I would say. And uh, uh, you should tackle that in uh, handling IFRS 3, whether the accounting for bargain purchases is correct accounting from an academic or a market point of view. But if the, uh, I, I would say, uh, why uh, uh, do not apply IFRS 3 consistently on that point? and make a difference in this project on um, uh, business combinations on, on common control. That was my comment on the acquisition methods. So I hand over again to Julia for the polling. Thank you very much. Uh, Torsten, just a quick question. Would it be appropriate for me to make a couple of uh, comments on Martin's comments before we go was, to Poland? I was, you read my mind. I was actually going to ask you if you wanted to, please. Oh, yes, I have a couple of thoughts I would like to share. Um, and, and one of them actually goes back to Martin's earlier commentary about uh, economic substance. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to step, take a step back and just reiterate again <clears throat> that there are different, sometimes conflicting considerations and the board is trying to strike the right balance between all those uh, different considerations. And fundamentally, I think where the board is trying to get to is that where combination under common control is similar to a business combination between unrelated parties, then we apply the same method and to the extent, extent that it is similar. And when it is not similar, we apply a different method. And of course, um, one way to approach that would be to look at a set of indicators. And for example, this is something that can does, it doesn't only look at the effect of non-controlling shareholders, but it also looks, for example, at, you know, is the transaction at fair value? Can fair value be reliably measured? And other gaps have uh, different other ideas as well. And in developing the model, the board actually did consider using a set of indicators, and we consulted with that um, with our advisory um, accounting forum, forum advisory uh, 
I can't remember what it stands for, with our national group of standard setters. And actually what we discovered that there wasn't a lot of appetite for a set of indicators. And what we discovered that, for example, if you have non-controlling shareholders, from their point of view, it's not really particularly relevant whether the transaction is or is not at fair value. E even if it's not, still book value information is not really interesting for them. We also discovered, well, it's not really relevant for them. What is, let's say, the purpose of the transaction or whether fair value can be reliably measured. Irrespective of all that, if I'm a non-controlling shareholder and the company undertook a business combination under common control, well, fair value information about that combination tells me the best story. So in some ways, we can see this sort of focus on non-controlling shareholders as a tool to, to capture similar transactions. And also what I would like to add here, of course, even if the board were to look at other indicators, but what we discovered based on our research, if you have non-controlling shareholders, chances are the transaction will be at fair value. So essentially by taking just one condition, we are indirectly capturing other conditions as well. Uh, and lastly, I think it's fair to say that the board also felt that you know, if you are accounting firm and practice today, looking at a particular transaction and particular set of facts and circumstances, you can apply professional judgment and you can weigh all those specific facts and circumstances. However, it's quite difficult to write a standard in a way that would enable those judgments to be correctly made in all cases. So that's, that's, that's going to the point about, you know, if we have non-controlling shareholders, probably a transaction is at fair value. And then I just had a couple of other quick comments uh, on Martin's um, discussion about consistency with IS-1 and consistency with IFRS-3. And with IS-1, I think, you know, the board would entirely agree that it is possible, it is possible in theory you can have a distribution because it is transaction with owners acting in their capacity with owners. But the problem is, that to separately identify, measure, and recognize a distribution would be very difficult. Because in order to do that, you need to either uh, measure fair value of the business, not fair value of assets and liabilities, but fair value of the business as a whole. You need to put a single number of it, which is, which is quite difficult. But also, ideally, you need to be able to price the synergies. And synergies is not even a market participant perspective. It is an entity unique perspective. It's unique to this combination. It's also about how well you negotiate. So the board decided that it would be impossible to measure a distribution. And of course, the board also noted that you can have an element of, of overpayment in a regular transaction, but there is no requirement to identify, measure, and recognize it separately, again, because it's not possible. But we would be very, very interested to see what, what stakeholders think about it. And on UIFRS three comment, and I'd like to be very careful with what I say here, but I think one could make an argument that what the board is suggesting is actually not a departure from IFRS 3. And this is because IFRS 3 already tells us if it's a separate transaction embedded in a business combination under common control, then you identify and measure that transaction separately. And one could make an argument that the contribution from a um, controlling party is a separate transaction, which is identified uh, measured and recognized separately. And then after that, we apply um, IFRS 3 accounting. Again, it's debatable. And we are very aware that in practice, accounting firms, I think it's, it's one of the big questions they consider uh, these types of situations. So with that... Th <laughs> thank you, Julia, for your comments. Um, shall we move to the polling okay. questions? Yes, please, let's do the poll. and. Um... After voting, the results will be shared immediately. By Baha is going to take care of that. So, so let's have uh, participants' views on this question about the acquisition method. And that goes back to the heart of what we just discussed. Should it be exactly as in IFRS 3? Is it exactly as in IFRS 3 plus disclosures? Um, should we apply IFRS 3 plus contribution, but not a distribution? Or should we recognize contributions and distributions in these scenarios?
There so is definitely quite a bit of appetite for disclosure, isn't it? Mm -hmm. While you're voting on this question, please don't forget to ask your questions in the chat, if there are any. And maybe while we're voting, I could actually, I know Torf, you were interested in what we've heard from users. And we actually consulted with users in our initial rounds on these contributions and distributions. Mm -hmm. And actually what we heard, uh, there wasn't a lot of interest from users in recognizing distributions. And I think it was due to a couple of reasons. First of all, I think they were uncomfortable with putting a single number on it. Uh, and instead they advocated more robust disclosures so they could make their own assessments how far the price is and was there an element of overpayment. And generally I think it's also fair to say and maybe to echo what Martin and uh, Patricia have said that there was a general desire uh, from users sort of not to tinker with IFRS 3 because any change to IFRS 3 would um, introduce additional complexity and they were not particularly keen on additional complexity. If I may, uh, since you're mentioning users' preferences, and this also relates to Martin's question, do you have current indications um, about users' preferences regarding bargain purchase accounting? Is that something that, I mean, given that um, Martin has just uh, talked about a paper that cannot show value relevance of bargain purchases. So in other words, um, financial statement users, at least investors that this um, paper covers, do not seem to price bargain purchases as gains. Uh, do you have any any current views on this issue? So I think it's important to highlight that we are not reconsidering or reopening any aspects of IFRS 3 in any shape or form in this project. So we're taking IFRS 3 as it stands today. And the only thing that we are considering to which extent and when its requirements are applicable to business combinations under common control and mm -hmm. when they are not. Um, so we have not been asking a question about uh, bargain purchase gains recognized in PNL. We have asked about contributions. I don't think we received a clear steer, to be honest. On distributions, I think our initial consultations did suggest that you know trying to recognize them is not particularly useful. On contributions, we had little feedback and mixed feedback. So we are we are, we are keen to hear more in this consultation. Thank you. So it seems like uh, voting has almost stopped. So Baha, would you please share the results so Irina, uh, Yulia can maybe comment briefly on what we're seeing here? Yes, and uh, I think we are seeing uh, quite a bit of appetite of applying IFRS 3 as it stands today, nearly half of the audience as it stands today with additional disclosures, because obviously it's a related party transaction, a quarter almost of the audience would just apply as it is with no modifications. Clearly hardly any interest in um, distributions and not a lot of interest in contributions either. So clearly it would be a point, uh, a point of debate in this consultation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So there's one question in the chat by by Ufu Mr. Yolu, would you like to post your question to answer to ask your question, please? Sure, please. Oh, go ahead. Hi, uh, my my question is on the chat already. Uh, so uh, I thought you know the use of uh, book value, as Martin said, uh, could be optional and uh, at least that gives an advantage to those who would like to use the acquisition method rather than the book value method. Uh, if you force uh, the companies who are using, you know, uh, who would like to use uh, acquisition method, and but if you want them to use the, man, uh, the book value method mandatorily, uh, my question is that, do you think this would reduce uh, the value relevance of information, especially the, the goodwill recognition on the balance sheet under the acquisition method? Thank you. 
So I think, again, there are probably different views on this topic. And I think that the research that Martin shared with us earlier, recognizing that there isn't a lot of research on the topic, it does seem to indicate that the views, um, the views are different. So I don't think it's, it's, it's possible to opine one way or another. I think it's also fair to say, you know, if we think about scenarios in preparation for an IPO, and this is an important scenario because this is a type of transaction that will affect public shareholders. So it seems that in those scenarios, using the acquisition method might not provide the best result because the resulting numbers in financial statements will depend on how you structure a combination and we heard quite loud and clear from users that structuring should not affect accounting numbers. So one could make an argument that one, one could make an argument, well, maybe pre IPO, it should be a fresh start. Maybe everything should be at fair value or everything should be at historical value. But having a mix and, mix and match of, you know, some stuff is at fair value, some stuff is at historical value, just based on how you structured, that does not seem particularly useful on the, on the face of it. And also, we did hear, in particular from some jurisdictions, not from all, but there are concerns about accounting arbitrage. And sort of on one hand, there is an argument that acquisition method would provide useful information, you know, to non-controlling shareholders that, you know, might provide useful information to lenders and other creditors. On the other hand, uh, it is my understanding that in some jurisdictions, uh, the use of the acquisition method is a tool um, to receive tax deductions and that companies undertake and structure transactions with the sole purpose of getting their desired accounting treatment and their desired tax treatment. And of course, it's not the ISB's role to um, sort of um, worry about those scenarios, but I think it is at least important to be aware of that because at the end of the day, one of the objectives of this project is to eliminate accounting choice. And if, um, if the conditions that the board will ultimately propose are not robust enough and are not objective enough, then this accounting choice might not be eliminated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In, mm -hmm. in contrast, we have heard from some users, I think it's a minority, that they prefer book value in all cases because they see it as helping with trend analysis. Mm -hmm. So it, okay. it will be very interesting to see where everybody ends up on this. So exactly, we've heard that numbers. as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So continuity in the numbers. And you were gonna say, you were gonna comment as well. And would you, would you like to add? Oh, yeah, th thanks, Thorsten. Um, yeah, I, I would just like to add a bit as well because it's such an interesting um, situation and uh, we've had some uh, academic commentary about giving a choice. And I think Yulia is touching on that, that um, choices do make things from difficult for users. So yeah. we do hear from investors um, about this issue of giving choices. And, and so, you know, when we started, we did start with acquisition method and say, you know, in what scenario should we have the acquisition method? So it wasn't as if we didn't consider the, the position that Martin and others are suggesting to, to start with, you know, to, to require the IFRS 3 acquisition method. That, that was actually our starting point. But as we progressed, um, we could see that in some situations, there wasn't the demand for that information. And we do have to think about other things like um, the trend information for, for um, under the book value method. So I, I think it, as you look at the process, there has been a very thorough consideration of, of, of these factors. Um, and that's why now we're putting it out for consultation and we do want to hear, hear what people think. Um, often Yulia and the team have described it to the board as thinking about where to draw the line and so, as Yulia has said today, um, we're not redebating IFRS 3 or the acquisition method in IFRS 3, but what we are talking about is, is where to put the line uh, between a business combination that um, uh, between non parties that are not uh, under common control and those that are. Thanks, Thorsten. Absolutely. So, clearly, a very difficult choice to make and to justify. Let's maybe. Um, turn to the third aspect 
of this topic, and that is how to apply the book value method. Paolo, this is over to you again. Uh, thank you, Thorsten. Uh, as you know, existing FRS standards do not refer to any book value method, and there is diversity in practice in how the method is applied. The board's preliminary view is that it should specify a single book value method in IFRS standards and require the receiving entity to measure assets and liability received using the book values in the financial statements of the transferred company. Generally, measure consideration paid at book value, recognize within equity any difference between the consideration and the book value of the net assets received, and finally, include in its financial statement the results, assets, and liabilities of the transferred company prospectively from the combination date. The board has not yet considered further detailed aspects of how a book value method should be applied. It plans to consider them in the next stage of the project after the foundation of the model are confirmed. Uh, next slide, please. As I said earlier, slide 43. We have a, another problem with the slide. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying with the slide. They seem a little bit, oh, here we go. Thank you. As a, so uh, as I said earlier, a vari variety of book value methods are currently used in practice. And stakeholders' views on how a receiving company should apply a book value method are often linked to their views on when and why the receiving company should apply that method. This slide summarizes these different views. Uh, although most stakeholders agree that any difference between consideration and assets and liability transferred should be recognized in equity, variations uh, usually relate to for example, which book value should be used? Some stakeholders are in favor of using the transferred company's book value because that approach adopts the perspective of the combining companies rather than the controlling party's perspective. Others favor using the controlling party's book values either because these values reflect the perspective of the controlling party or because in some cases, those values may be more up to date. Another difference relates to pre-combination information. Some stakeholders are in favor of a retrospective approach. In other words, combining the receiving company and the transfer company as if they had always been combined with pre-combination information restate. Others advocate a prospective presentation from the date of combination without restatement of pre-combination information. Moving on to, to slide 44, the board consider whether the... It does get stuck. Oh, I don't know how... Okay, thank you, okay. perfect. So the board consider whether the receiving company should measure assets and liabilities received at the transferred company's book values or at the controlling party's book values. Those values will typically be identical if the controlling party had always controlled the transferred company. However, as uh, in this, this slide illustrates, they can differ if, for example, the transferred company had previously been acquired from an external party. The board's preliminary view is that the receiving company should measure assets and liabilities received using the transfer company's book values. This view reflects the fact that these values will present the combination from the perspective of the combining companies and not from the perspective of the controlling party, which is not a party of the transaction, providing information about assets and liabilities of the combining companies irrespective of how the combination is structured. Slide 45 summarizes the board's preliminary view on how to measure consideration paid. Indeed, it can take various forms. It's usually paid in cash or in the receiving company's own share. 
but sometimes it's paid in non-cash assets or by incurring or assuming liabilities. The board examined whether uh, consideration should be measured at fair value or book value and concluded that the consideration paid should be measured at its book value. The board's preliminary view is that it should not prescribe how consideration in own shares should be presented because of this would only affect presentation within the receiving company's equity. And the board generally doesn't prescribe presentation in equity. Also, the board noted that measuring consideration of book value or at fair value will produce a similar outcome for some common forms of consideration. For example, that would be the case if consideration is paid in cash or by incurring financial liabilities. Slide, next slide, please. The board also considered how to report for any difference between the consideration paid and net assets. Such a difference may include various economic components, for example, contribution to or distribution from the receiving company's equity, unrecognized goodwill, including any synergies arising as a result of the combination. The board noted that splitting this difference in separate economic components and measuring and recognizing those components separately will not meet the cost-benefit trade-off and could effectively eliminate the differences between the acquisition method and the book value method. Accordingly, the board's preliminary view is that the receiving company should recognize within equity any difference between the consideration paid and the book value of assets and liabilities received, which is consistent with the current practice and that it should not prescribe in which components of equity the receiving company should present it. As said earlier, stakeholders express mixed views on providing pre-combination information. This may depend on the existing, the existing practice. Indeed, in some cases, entities combine pre-combination information about all combining companies from the first reporting period presented. This means that the receiving company restates its pre-combination information and provides comparative information about itself and the transferred company. In other cases, similar to the approach in the acquisition method under IFRS 3, comparative information is provided only about the receiving company without restatement. The board's preliminary view is, is to go for the prospective approach because a retrospective approach will result in performa information about a group that did not really exist in that form in the past. And with this, I hand it over to Patricia. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. We've got exactly the same questions as Paolo's raised in terms of issues. We agree with a lot of what the ISB is proposing, but on this measurement of assets and liabilities received, we consider that both the carrying amounts of, in the financial statements, the transferred in, entity and the carrying amounts in the um, ultimate parent entities books, both provide useful information. So we're getting useful information from the transferred entity that keeps the same trend information for users who get information at the transferred company level. But if we go to the ultimate controlling entity or the controlling party, we're going probably going to get more up to date information, particularly if the transferred entity was acquired subsequent to being created. So we might get a more recent valuation. We also keep given we're dealing with business combinations under common control. We're keeping the perspective of the controlling party. So we're still within that under common control. We've also got to allow for the possibility that the transferred entity did not prepare IFRS financial statements. They may have done sufficient for consolidation purposes. They may have been immaterial for the group. So there would be potentially quite a lot of work to create those. So from our point of view, the question's open we're going to be seeking views. If we go to the next slide, please, Julia. Uh, 
I'm trying but, to get stuck. I keep trying. But no, don't, don't worry about it. So what I'm going to say is we generally agree with everything else, um, but there's a couple of issues we want to raise. One is it's not clear to us whether there could be other forms of consideration. So we're trying to find out whether there are some other forms of consideration, and if there are, how pervasive are they? And we're certainly hearing from users or from some users that they do want retrospective um, presentation. We don't yet have information on the weighting of users, but we are hearing a view that pre-combination information should be restated. So in the interest of time, I think that summarizes where we are at the moment. And so it's over to Martin. Thank you, Patricia. I have one slide with some academic commentary. First on terminology. If we talk about a book value method with retrospective application, we already mentioned in the term pooling of interest accounting, which stems from IS-22 and merger accounting, which is more a UK term. And for prospective application, uh, a terminology that is normally used in practice is carryover accounting. And I would say that the, the ISB might consider this terminology as a sort of pragmatic shortcut to uh, business combinations under common control using the book value method, which is the official name of this method. Uh, and carryover accounting is a little bit easier to, uh, to handle, and it suggests carrying over a transaction and, and also a carrying amount is also part of the, of the term. So why not uh, use that terminology for this method? Uh, some conceptual comments. Uh, uh, I, I, I could very much agree with the choice made in the discussion paper of using book values from the transferred company. I do understand uh, uh, what Patricia just said about uh, using it from the, uh, the holding company, the consolidated company. Uh, but look at it from the perspective of the company that prepares the financial statement. It is a transaction between the receiving company and the transferred company. And in fact, from this transaction perspective, the controlling company has nothing to do with that. So that's why I could uh, could live and could agree with the, the choice what was made. I have some doubts about another choice. That's the consideration paid in assets and book value, not at fair value, primarily for cost benefit reasons. And again, I, I know the ISB is not very fond of ha having choices, but I, I don't think it's very much a choice. It's, it's the better method is measurement at fair value closer resemblance to paying cash. Uh, Julia just talked about similar transactions should be handled in the same way. It should it make a difference whether you uh, have your consideration in cash or whether you have your consideration in an asset. And if you consider that similarly, you should have the asset at book value because that's the resemblant cash amount. And uh, if it's for cost benefit reasons, that, that might differ depending on the kind of the asset and the nature of a company. I, I, personally, I would prefer having one choice of, of fair value, but I can then imagine that there is an optional exemption of book value for cost benefit reasons. But that's another way around then, then requiring the book value. Those were my comments for now. Thank you, Martin. So Julia, maybe you would like to give us a brief response on this if you, uh, if you would like to end or start the polling question. Um, so this is up to you. I probably make only one comment on, um, on, on, on the point that Martin touched upon with respect to how to measure consideration in the form of assets. And what I would like to say is that that was probably one question within the whole range of questions about the book value method that the board most debated. Um, and I think on balance, the board decided that a book value approach is, is better. And this is... Um, a book value measurement is better and this is for combination of reasons so it's not only the cost benefit but i think um it's probably fair to say that as so some of the board members at least view um a business combination under common control which is paid for in assets not as a disposal of assets followed by purchase of a business but they sort of view it as an exchange transaction and they look at it sort of holistically at one transaction that is being accounted for at book value on both sides and without creating any 
gains or losses. In some ways, I suppose it's a little bit similar to the thinking for not recognizing a gain if it is bargain, but instead um, recognizing a contribution. So there is some internal symmetry, if you will, that this transaction does not result um, in gains and losses. But again, just to reiterate that the board um, debated this question quite a lot. So it would be very interesting to see what stakeholders uh, say in this consultation. Um, shall we uh, go to the polling question and see what, yes. what the audience thinks? Yes, let's see what our participants say about this question. All right. Good, and so this is your third and last chance to make your views heard. Also, we have a few more minutes for one or two chat questions, uh, if you would like. Otherwise, we're trying to stay within this already quite long two hour window today. And the question we selected for this polling question is, is one area in how to apply a book value method where we expect quite a lot of debate. Um, it is interesting to see that this audience so far does not seem to have a lot of appetite or just appearing for retrospective, um, retrospective application. But, but I, I, I'm expecting that we might have uh, diverse views on this particular question. Maybe people feel pragmatic today or tired towards the end of the session. I don't know. It's also interesting. So we discussed this question with users of financial statements and we actually expected before we consulted them that they would like to see um, a retrospective combination so they could see trends. But um, to, to, to our surprise, to some extent, again, in the initial rounds um, of consultations, they seemed to prefer prospective application. And this is because they recognized that pre-combination information is pro forma, is hypothetical. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it could be subject to a lot of measurement uncertainty. And also fundamentally, it reflects, it reflects a group that did not exist in that forum before. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, even though this information is useful, but maybe some information can be provided in the notes, but not on the face of financial statements. Mm -hmm. But again, it would be interesting to see what other stakeholders think. Is that something, is that an argument you're hearing sometimes for retrospective application of new, new IFRS standards generally? Uh, I probably wouldn't comment on new IFRS standards in general, just because I haven't looked at it holistically, but this is certainly something we've heard um, mm -hmm. with respect to this particular topic. And I suppose from the board perspective, one, one uh, factor the board uh, had in mind that this is not really a recognition or measurement question. So pre-combination information would affect the year of the combination. Mm -hmm. It would affect the next year, sort of, you know, in terms of comparative information. But after that, it all washes off. It doesn't really affect recognition or measurement. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we can end the poll and we're almost ready to end the session. There are no questions in the chat about this. But I would like to turn it over to Anna to make a concluding statement uh, and share some information about the IFRS, you, uh, about the IFRS organization's website. Thank you, Thorsten. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, the participants today have uh, enjoyed uh, and uh, have found uh, this uh, workshop helpful. I just wanted to share here um, and refer the participants to our academic uh, webpage of the IFRS Foundation. And you can find the web link on the last uh, slide of, uh, the, of this slide deck. So uh, we have been uh, holding a number of uh, academic uh, engagements uh, to encourage research. And particularly, I want to mention the three webinars that uh, we have organized uh, on IFRS 9, financial instruments, IFRS 16, leases, and IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers. 
uh, two of these have already taken place and one of them is going to take place on 8th of February, but you can find the recordings uh, on the website. These uh, webinars are uh, aimed at the academic audience and to encourage research for the upcoming post implementation review of uh, the three standards and um, in the in the new section of this web page we'll be making announcements in the next uh, few weeks about uh, journal special issues and uh, upcoming conferences where uh, participants uh, can uh, find potential outlets for for their research so uh, do check uh, the uh, the new section of the academic web page uh, mm -hmm. if you're interested in that. Mm -hmm. That's what thank I you. think this is a great uh, resource and under the uh, under the subheading of how we work with academics where you list all the different formats. Feel free to include this workshop that we're that we're holding today and and, and the others we have and and perhaps we can link to each other's websites on that. Yes, the recordings do appear uh, on the news uh, section, Thorsten. Right, right. We'll do that. Thank you. Good. So I would like to thank all of you who participated uh, today um, in your active roles, uh, ISB, uh, FRAG, and our academic representative, Martin. Um, I think this was another interesting discussion. I hope that uh, the standard setters took away important um, feedback from constituents and um, looking very much forward to seeing you again in our next um, workshop, which is going to be on crypto assets. As we've said, uh, this one will be headed by FRAG. The date uh, has not yet been determined, but we will keep you posted. And uh, please check back on our EAA Accounting Resources Center website for news on that one. All right. Thanks again and have a good weekend, everybody.